Hi, hello there. Welcome to Application Layer. As you have learned, the transport layer is where data actually gets moved from one host to another. But before that can take place, there are a lot of details that have to be determined so that this data transport happens correctly. This is why there is an application layer in both the OSI and the TCP IP models. As an example, before there was a streaming video over the internet, we had to watch home movies in a variety of other ways. Imagine that you have videotaped some of your child's soccer game. Your parents in another city only have a video cassette player. So you have to copy your video from your camera onto the right type of video cassette to send to them. Your brother has a DVD player. So you transfer your video to a DVD format to send to him. This is what the application layer is all about. Making sure that your data is in a format that the receiving device can use. Let's dive in. This video lecture is entitled Application Layer. So at the end of this video lecture, you should be able to explain the operation of application layer protocols in providing support to end users applications. So along with this, these are the topics or subtopics to be discussed, application, presentation, and session layer, peer-to-peer, -peer, web and email protocols, IP addressing services, and file sharing services. Application, presentation, and session layers. Application layer. In the OSI and TCP IP models, the application layer is the closest layer to the end user. As shown in the figure, it is the layer that provides the interface between the applications used to communicate and the underlying network over which messages are transmitted. Application layer protocols are used to exchange data between programs running on the source and destination hosts. So from the figure, this is actually based on the TCP IP model. The upper three layers, which are the application, presentation, and session, defines the functions of the TCP IP application layer. There are many application layer protocols and new protocols are always being developed. Some of the most widely known application layer protocols includes DNS, HTTP, SMTP, POP, DHCP, FTP, and IMAP. Presentation layer. The presentation layer has three primary functions. Formatting or presenting data at the source device into a compatible format for receipt by the destination device. Compressing data in a way that can be decompressed by the destination device. Encrypting data for transmission and decrypting data upon receipt. So as shown here in the figure, the presentation layer formats data for the applications layer and it sets standards for file formats. Some well-known standards for video includes MKV or the Matroska video, Motion Picture Experts Group or MPG, and MOV for the QuickTime video. Some well-known graphic image formats are the GIF or the Graphics Interchange Format, the Joint Photographic Expert Group, or JPG, and the Portable Network Graphics, or PNG format. Next is Session Layer. As the name implies, functions at the Session Layer create and maintains dialogue between source and destination applications. The Session Layer handles the exchange of information to initiate dialogue, keep them active, to restart sessions that are disrupted or idle for a long period of time. 
TCP/IP application layer protocols. The TCP/IP application protocols specify the format and control information necessary for many common internet communication functions. Application layer protocols are used by both the source and destination devices during a communication session. For the communications to be successful, the application layer protocols that are implemented on the source and destination host must be compatible. Like for instance, you've got the DNS or the domain name system or service. So it is a TCP or UDP client 53. It translates domain names such as cisco.com into an IP addresses. So another is the host config, boot TP, bootstrap protocol, UDP client 68, server 67. It enables a diskless workstation to discover its own IP address, the IP address of a boot server on the network, and a file to be loaded into the memory to boot the machine. Boot TP is being superseded by DHCP or the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol with UDP Client 68 and Server Port 67. Dynamically assigns an IP address to be reused when no longer in needed. Another is email. For the email protocols, you have sort of SMTP or the same poll mail transfer protocol. This is TCP port 25 it enables clients to send email to a mail server. It also enables servers to send email to other servers. Another email protocol is POP3 or the post office protocol. That is TCP 110. It enables clients to retrieve email from a mail server, downloads the email to the local mail application of the client. You also have IMAP for the email, Internet Messaging Access Protocol. This is TCP-143, which enables clients to access email stored on a mail server and maintains email on the server. Another protocol on the application layer is FTP for File Transfer Protocol. This is TCP port 20 to 21. It sets rules that enable a user on one host to access and transfer files to and from another host over the network. FTP is a reliable, connection-oriented, and acknowledged file delivery protocol. You also have TFTP or the Trivial File Transfer Protocol. That is UDP Client 69. A simple, connectionless file transfer protocol with best effort unacknowledged file delivery. It uses less overhead than FTP. And for the web, HTTP and HTTPS. HTTP or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that is TCP port 80 or 8080 or 8008. HTTP is a set of rules for exchanging text, graphic images, sound, video, and other multimedia files on the World Wide Web. You also have the HTTPS or the HTTP Secure, that is TCP or UDP port 443. The browser uses encryption to secure HTTP communications, authenticates the website to which you are connecting your browser. Peer-to-peer. Client-server model. In the previous topic, you learned that TCP IP application layer protocols implemented on both the source and destination host must be compatible. In this topic, you will learn about the client-server model and the processes used which are in the application layer. The same is true for peer-to-peer -peer network. In the client-server model, the device requesting the information is called a client. 
and the device responding to the request is called server. The client is a hardware or software combination that people use to directly access the resources that are stored on the server. Client and server processes are considered to be in the application layer. The client begins the exchange by requesting data from the server, which responds by sending one or more streams of data to the client. The application layer protocols describe the format of the requests and responses between clients and servers. In addition, the actual data transfer, this exchange may also require user authentication and the identification of data file to be transferred. One example of a client-server network is using the email service of an ISP to send, receive, and store email. The email client on a home computer issues a request to the mail server of the ISP for any unread mail. The server responds by sending the requested email to the client. Data transfer from a client to the server is referred to as upload and data from a server to the client is called download. So as shown here in the figure, files are downloaded from the server to the client. Peer-to-peer -peer networks. In peer-to-peer -peer or P2P networking model, the data is accessed from a peer device without the use of a dedicated server. The P2P network model involves two parts. So you've got the P2P networks and the P2P applications. Both parts have similar features, but in practice work quite differently. In a P2P network, two or more computers are connected via a network and can share resources such as printers and files. That is without having a dedicated server. Every connected end device known as peer can function as both server and client. So one computer might assume the role of a server for one transaction while simultaneously serving as a client for another. The roles of the client and server are set on a per request basis. In addition to sharing files, a network such as this one would allow users to enable network games and share an internet connection. So in a peer-to-peer -peer connections or exchange, both devices are considered equal in the communication process. So peer one has files that are shared with peer two and can access the shared printer that is directly connected to peer two to print files. Peer two is sharing directly connected printer with peer one while accessing the shared files on peer one as shown here in this figure. Peer-to-peer -peer applications. A P2P application allows a device to act as both client and server within the same communication as shown here in the figure. In this model, every client is a server and every server is a client. The P2P applications require that each end device provide a user interface and run a background service. Some P2P applications use hybrid systems where resource sharing is decentralized, but the indexes that point to resource locations are stored in a centralized directory. In a hybrid system, each peer accesses an index server to get the location of a resource stored on another peer. So both server and clients, okay, or clients and servers, or both clients simultaneously initiate and receive messages. So take note that this is a peer-to-peer -peer communications. One can be a server and a client at the same time. Common P2P applications. So with P2P applications, each computer in the network that is running on the application can act as a client or as a server for the other computers in the network that are also running the application. So common P2P networks includes BitTorrent, DirectConnect, eDonkey, and Freenet. 
Some P2P applications are based on the Nutella protocol where each user shares whole files with other users. So as shown in the figure, the Nutella compatible client software allows the users to connect to the Nutella services over the internet. Okay, so that is to locate and access resources shared by the Nutella peers. So many Nutella client applications are available, including uh, MicroTorrent, BitComet, DC++, uh, Deluge, and Emule. The Nutella P2P application search for shared resources on multiple peers, as what you see here in this diagram. Many P2P applications allow users to share pieces of many files with each other at the same time. Clients use a torrent file to locate other users who have pieces that they need so that they can connect directly to them. This file also contains information about tracker computers that keep track of which users have specific pieces of certain files. So clients ask for pieces from multiple users at the same time. This is known as Swarn and the technology is called BitTorrent. So BitTorrent has its own client. But there are many other BitTorrent clients, including MicroTorrent, Deluge, and QBitTorrent. So take note that any type of file can be shared between users. Many of these files are copyrighted. So meaning that the only creator has the right to use and distribute them. It is against the law to download or distribute copyrighted files without the permission from the copyright holder. So copyright violation can result in a criminal charges and civil lawsuits. Web and email protocols. Hypertext transfer protocol and hypertext markup language. There are different layer specific protocols that are designed for common uses such as web browsing and email. The first topic gave you an overview about these protocols. This topic goes into more detail. When a web server or when a web address or uniform resource locator or the URL is typed into a web browser, the web browser establishes a connection to the web service. The web service is running on the server that is using the HTTP protocol. URLs and uniform resource locators or identifiers or URIs are the names most people associate with web addresses. So to better understand how the web browser and the web server interact, examine a web page is opened in a browser. For this example, let's take cisco.com okay so um, it has of course step one the browser interprets the three parts of the url so that is the http or the protocol or scheme you also have the www.cisco.com which is the server name and of course our index.html the specific file name requested. Step two, the browser then checks with the name server to convert www.cisco.com into a numeric IP address, which it uses to connect to the server. So the client initiates an HTTP request to the server by sending a GET request to the server and asks for the index.html file. So step three, in response to the request, the server sends the HTML code for this web page to the browser. And step four, the browser deciphers the HTML code and formats the page for the browser window. So you can now see it on the screen of the client. HTTP and HTTPS. HTTP is a request response protocol. So when a client, typically a web browser, sends a request to the web server, HTTP specifies the message types 
used for that communication. So the three common messages or message types are get, okay, post, and put. So the get, this is a client request for data. A client web browser sends the get message to the web server to request the HTML pages. Now the post, this uploads data files to the web server such as form data and put this uploads resources or content to the web server, such as an image. So although HTTP is remarkably flexible, it is not a secure protocol. So the request messages send information to the server in plain text that can be intercepted and read. The server responses with typical HTML pages that are also unencrypted. So for secure communication across the internet, the HTTP secure or HTTPS protocol is used. So HTTPS uses authentication and encryption to secure data as it travels between the client and the server. HTTP uses the same client request server response process as HTTP, but the data stream is encrypted with secure socket layer or SSL. Okay, so before being transported across the network. Email protocols. One of the primary services offered by an ISP is email hosting. To run on a computer or other end device, email requires several applications and services as shown here in the figure. So email is a store and forward method of sending, storing, and retrieving electronic messages across the network. So email messages are stored in a databases on mail servers. Email clients communicate with mail servers to send and receive email. The mail servers communicate with other mail servers to transport messages from one domain to another. An email client does not communicate directly with another email client when sending an email. So instead, both clients rely on the mail server to transport messages. So email supports three separate protocols for operations. So you've got SMTP or the simple mail transfer protocol used to send mail. You also have the POP or POP post office protocol which is used for clients to receive email okay same thing with imap now the application layer process that sends mail uses smtp a client retrieves email using one of the two application layers pop and imap smtp pop and imap so smtp message formats requires a message header and a message body. Although the message body can contain any amount of text, the message header must have a properly formatted recipient email address and a sender address. When a client sends an email, the client SMTP process connects with a server SMTP process on a well-known port, port 25. Okay, so which is the protocol number for SMTP. So after the connection is made, the client attempts to send the email to the server across the connection. So when the server receives the message, it either places the message in a local account if the recipient is local or forward the message to another mail server for delivery. The destination email server may not be online or may be busy when the email messages are sent. So therefore, SMTP pulls messages to be sent at a later time. So periodically, the server checks the check or messages and attempts to send them again. If the message is still not delivered after the predetermined expiration time, it is returned to the sender as undeliverable. So POP is used by an application to retrieve mail from the mail server. So with POP, mail is downloaded 
from the server to the client and then deleted on the server so this is the default operation of pop okay so the server starts the pop service by passively listening on tcp port 110 for client connection requests when the client wants to make use of the service it sends a request to establish a tcp connection with the server and then when the connection is established the pop server sends a greeting so the client and the POP server then exchange commands and responses until the connection is closed or aborted. So with POP, email messages are downloaded to the client and removed from the server. So there is no centralized location where email messages are kept. So because POP does not store messages, it is not recommended for a small business that needs a centralized backup solution. POP3 is the most commonly used version of POP. IMAP. So IMAP is another protocol that describes a method to retrieve email messages. Unlike POP, when the user connects to an IMAP capable server, copies of the messages are downloaded to the client application as shown here in the figure. Okay, now the original messages are kept on the server until manually deleted. So users view copies of the messages in their email client software. So users can create a file hierarchy on the server to organize and store mail. That file structure is duplicated on the email client as well. So when a user decides to delete a message, the server synchronizes that action and deletes the message from the server. IP addressing services. Domain name service or DNS. There are other application layer specific protocols that were designed to make it easier to obtain addresses for network devices. So these services are essential because it would be very time consuming to remember IP address instead of URLs or manually configure all of the devices in a medium to large network. The first topic in this module gave you an overview of these protocols. This topic goes into more detail about the IP addressing services, DNS and DHCP. In data networks, devices are labeled with numeric IP addresses to send and receive data over the networks. Domain names were created to convert the numeric address into a simple recognizable name. On the internet, the FQDN or the fully qualified domain name such as HTTP Cisco.com or HTTP www.cisco.com. Okay, so these are much easier for people to remember than 192.133.219.25 which is the IP address that corresponds to cisco.com okay now if cisco decides to change the numeric address of www.cisco.com it is transparent to the user because the domain name remains the same the new address is simply linked to the existing domain and connectivity is maintained so the DNS protocol defines an automated service that matches resource names with the required numeric network addresses. So it includes formats for queries, responses, and data. Now the DNS protocol communicates use a single format called message. This message format is used for all types of client queries and server responses, error messages, and the transfer of resource record information between servers. So from this figure, step one, the user types an FQDN into a browser application address field. Okay, something like in here, HTTP www.cisco.com. Step two, a DNS query is sent to the designated DNS server for the client computer. And then step three, the DNS server matches the FQDN 
with its IP address. Next, step four, the DNS query response is set back to the client with the IP address for the FQDN. Okay, and then step five, the client computer uses the IP address to make the requests of the server. DNS message format. The DNS server stores different types of resource records that are used to resolve names. These records contain the name, address, and type of record. Some of these records are as follows. So you've got A, an end device IPv4 address. NS, the authoritative name server. The quad A, an end device IPv6 address. And MX, which is a mail exchange record. So when a client makes a query, the DNS process first look at its own records to resolve the name. If it is unable to resolve the name by using its stored records, it contacts other servers to resolve the name. After a match is found and returned to the original requesting server, the server temporarily stores the numbered address in the event that the same name is requested again. So the DNS client service on Windows PC also stores previously resolved names in the memory. So you could use the ipconfig backslash or forward slash display DNS command displaying all the cache DNS entries. As shown in this table, DNS uses the same message format between servers consisting of question, answer, authority, and additional information for all types of client queries and server responses, error messages, and transfer of resource record information. DNS Hierarchy The DNS protocol uses a hierarchical system to create a database to provide name resolution as shown here in the figure. So DNS uses domain names to form the hierarchy. The naming structure is broken down into small manageable zones. Each DNS server maintains a specific database file and is only responsible for managing named mappings for all that small portion of the entire DNS structure. So when the DNS server receives a request for name translation that is not within its DNS zone, the DNS server forwards the request to another DNS server within the proper zone for translation. So DNS is scalable because hostname resolution is spread across multiple servers. The different top level domains represent either the type of organization or the country of origin. So examples of top level domains like .com, okay, a business or industry, .org, a nonprofit organization, that AU for Australia, that PH for the Philippines, and that CO for Colombia. The NS lookup command. When configuring a network device, one or more DNS server addresses are provided that the DNS client can use for name resolution. Usually, the ISP provides the addresses to use for the DNS servers. When a user application requests to connect to a remote device by name, the requesting DNS client queries the same or the name server to resolve the name to a numeric address. So computer operating systems also have a utility called NSLOOKUP that allows the user to manually query the name servers to resolve a given host name. This utility can also be used to troubleshoot name resolution issues and to verify the current status of the name servers. Now in this figure, when the NSLOOKUP command is issued, the default DNS server configured to your host is displayed. All right? So the name of the host or domain can be entered at the NSLOOKUP prompt. The NSLOOKUP utility has many options available for extensive testing and verification of the DNS processes.
Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol or DHCP. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol or DHCP for IPB for service automates the assignment of IPB for addresses, subnet masks, gateways or default gateways, and other IPB for networking parameters. So this is referred to as dynamic addressing. The alternative to dynamic addressing is, of course, the static addressing. When using static addressing, the network administrator manually enters an IP address information on hosts. So when a host connects to the network, the DHCP server is contacted and an address is requested. The DHCP server chooses an address from a configured range of addresses called pool and assigns or leases it to the host. On a larger networks or where user population changes frequently, DHCP is preferred for address assignment. New users may arrive and need connections. Others may have new computers that must be connected. So rather than using a static addressing for each connection, it is more efficient to have an IPB for addresses assigned automatically using DHCP. DHCP can allocate IP addresses for a configurable period of time called lease period. So the lease period is an important DHCP setting. When the lease period expires or DHCP server gets a DHCP release message, the address is returned to the DHCP pool for reuse. Users can freely move from one location to another location and easily establish or reestablish network connections or connectivity through the DHCP. As shown here in this figure, various types of devices can be DHCP server. It could be a router, it could be a local server, or it could be your wireless router. The DHCP server in most medium to large networks are usually a local dedicated PC-based server. With home networks, the DHCP server is usually located on the local router that connects the home network to the ISP. Many networks use both DHCP and static addressing. DHCP is used for general purpose hosts such as end user devices. Static addressing is used for network devices such as gateway routers, switches, servers, and printers. DHCP for IPv6 provides similar services for IPv6 clients. One important difference is that DHCP v6 does not provide a default gateway address. This can only be obtained dynamically from the router advertisement message of the router. DHCP operation. As shown here in the figure, when an IPv4 DHCP configured device boots up or connects to the network, the client broadcasts a DHCP discover a looking for the server. This is to identify any available DHCP servers on the network. A DHCP server replies with a DHCP offer, okay? which offers a list to the client. The offer message contains the IPB4 address and the subnet masks to be assigned. The IPB4 address of the DNS server and the IPB4 address of the default gateway. The list also offer duration of the list. Okay? Or how long would it take or how long would the client use the list IP address? The client may receive multiple DHCP offer messages if there is more than one DHCP server on the local area network. So therefore, it must choose between them and sends a DHCP request that identifies the explicit server and list offer that the client is accepting. A client can also choose to request an address that it had previously been allocated by the server. Assuming that IPB4 address requested by the client or offered by the server is still available, the server returns a DHCP acknowledgement or DHCP ACK message 
that acknowledges to the client that the lease has been finalized. If the offer is no longer valid, then the selected server responds with a DHCP negative acknowledgement or DHCP NAK message. If a DHCP NAC message is returned, then the selection process must begin again with a DHCP discover message being transmitted. So after the client has leased, it must be renewed prior to the lease expiration through another DHCP request message. The DHCP server ensures that all IP addresses are unique. The same IP address cannot be assigned to two different network devices simultaneously. Most ISPs use DHCP to allocate addresses to their customers. So DHCP V6 has a set of messages that is similar to DHCP V4. The DHCP V6 messages are solicit, advertise, information request, and reply. File sharing services. FTP or the file transfer protocol. So as you learned in the previous topic, in the client server model, the client can upload data to a server and download data from a server. If both devices are using file transfer protocol or FTP, so like HTTP, email, and addressing protocols, FTP is commonly used application layer protocol. This topic discusses FTP in more detail. FTP was developed to allow the data transfers between a client and a server. An FTP client is an application which runs on a computer that is being used to push or pull data from the FTP server. So as shown here in the figure, based on the command sent across the network, okay, data can be downloaded from the server or uploaded from the client. So the client establishes the first connection to the server for control traffic using TCP port 21. The traffic consists of client commands and server replies. The client establishes the second connection to the server for the actual data transfer using TCP port 20. This connection is created every time there is a data to be transferred. Okay. And then step three, the data transfer can happen in either direction. Okay. The client can download pull data from the server or the client can upload push data to the server. Server message block or SMB. The server message block SMB is a client server file sharing protocol that describes the structure of shared network resources, such as directories, files, printers, and serial ports. It is a request response protocol. All SMB messages share a common format. This format uses a fixed sized header followed by a variable sized parameter and data component. Now, here are the three functions of the SMP messages. So start, authenticate, and terminate sessions. You could have control file and printer access and allow an application to send or receive messages to or from another device. So SMB file sharing and print services have become a mainstay of the Microsoft networking. So with the introduction of Windows 2000 software series, Microsoft changed the underlying structure of using SMB. In the previous versions of Microsoft products, the SMB services used a non-TCP IP protocol to implement a name resolution. So beginning with Windows 2000, all subsequent Microsoft products uses DNS naming, which allows TCP IP protocols to directly support SMB resource sharing as shown here in the figure. SMB is a client server request response protocol. Servers can make their own resources available to clients on the network. The SMB file exchange process between Windows PCs is shown here in this diagram. This PC is sharing a directory to or 
to another computer and this computer also can share directory or files to this computer. So a file may be copied from PC to PC with Windows Explorer or File Explorer using the SMB protocol. Unlike the file sharing supported by FTP, clients established a long-term connection to servers. After the connection is established, the user of the client can access the resources on the server as though the resource is local to the client host. The Linux and Unix operating systems also provide a method of sharing resources with Microsoft networks by using a version of SMB called Samba. Okay? The Apple Macintosh operating systems also support resource sharing by using the SMB protocol. All right, so that ends up our video lecture on the application layer.